Uh, the Honourable Phil Goff. Mr Speaker, two weeks ago we embarked on the process of considering a piece of legislation uh, that was frankly unbalanced. It failed to get the balance right between our responsibility as a parliament to keep New Zealanders safe uh, and our responsibility equally as a parliament to ensure that we did not allow unnecessary and unwarranted intrusion into the private affairs of New Zealanders and uh, uh, cutting across their basic rights. The process, frankly, uh, began as a travesty uh, to get legislation through in two weeks with just two days for New Zealanders to prepare and give submissions to the committee was appalling and I hope that that never happens again. But I want to say, uh, to pay tribute to all members on the committee, uh, that the committee tried to make the best they could of that. Uh, when we first met with officials, and I want also to acknowledge the role of officials, uh, we asked that the legislation be given as early as possible to key organisations, and we demanded that if any cooperation was expected out of Labor, there had to be a process of hearing submissions. That happened before the bill was introduced. And I'll give credit to the Minister that uh, he listened to uh, the points that we were making. And the committee worked really hard right through Thursday, Friday night, Saturday morning, Monday, Monday night, uh, and we tried to do justice to the New Zealanders that wanted to be heard. And I know the Minister deeply regrets his comments about chip chat, um, and he apologised for it. And I always welcome an apology. We're still waiting for John Key's apology on misuse of the SIS for political reasons. But we have at least an apology from the Minister, and I, I give him credit for that. Uh, the process of submissions was really important. Uh, we heard very strong submissions from the Legislation Advisory Committee, the Privacy uh, Commissioner and the New Zealand Law Society, and we heard compelling submissions from New Zealanders, many of whom had never made a submission to a select committee before in their lives. And Labor did something that was fairly unprecedented as well. Uh, David Shearer and I produced a paper for the select committee and we went through the bill part by part and we said the amendments that we felt were necessary if this legislation was to be acceptable and if it was to get our support. And I've got a copy of the paper in my hand here and it's quite interesting reading uh, because if this was an exam I think we got 95%. Uh, I always prefer 100% but we'll, we'll settle for 95%. And we got that because the government was prepared to entertain arguments that said this legislation goes too far, it's not balanced and it needs changing. No. I think the overriding argument, sir, was that if there was an argument for this legislation at all, under that sort of urgency, it was for a very narrow range of threats that were posed by an emerging organisation called ISIS. And yet the bill as introduced was going to give powers that encompassed the wider scope of the SIS's authority. We, in our, I think, most significant achievement on the committee was to narrow the scope of the additional powers of visual surveillance and warrantless emergency surveillance only to those matters that pertained to a terrorist threat. If that was the justification for bringing the legislation in in the manner it was introduced, then that was what the bill should be confined to. And the Law Society and the Legislation Advisory Committee, headed up by the President of the Law Commission, Sir Grant Hammond, both said the threshold for visual surveillance, which is incredibly intrusive, and for unwarranted emergency surveillance, which was an unprecedented granting of power to the SIS, was much lower for the SIS than parallel powers were for the police because the police powers were specific and focused on serious crime, meriting uh, prison sentences of 14 years or more. The security intelligence service powers were very broad based on gathering of intelligence. So we pulled back the powers that we deemed unacceptable. And I think that when the government does its review next year, they need to very seriously consider whether they want to broaden those powers or whether we should keep the powers of the SIS 
as narrow as they can be while carrying out the vital function of providing intelligence information which might preempt any uh, terrorist attack. We don't believe in a surveillance society. We believe in giving the Security Intelligence Service the powers that they need to protect us and no more. And that is really an important principle that we need to consider. We've considered the question of passports. And under our Bill of Rights Act and under the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, there is a fundamental human right called the freedom of movement. People can come to and leave their country without unnecessary restrictions. And we accepted that there are people in New Zealand for whom that right of freedom of movement needs to be curtailed because their declared intention was to fight for an organisation committing crimes against humanity and war crimes. I accept that. I accept we've got an obligation under the United Nations Security Council Resolution 2178 to do what we can to stop people contributing their, their manpower to a terrorist organisation that I am utterly opposed to. But what I don't accept is that we should take that curtailment of a fundamental human right, the freedom to travel, and cover other areas where we might think it is unwise that a New Zealander goes to Syria to fight for the Free Syrian Army or against al-Assad, or we might think it is unwise that the Kurdish community might go to join the Peshmerga against ISIS, but actually we don't have the right to stop them in those instances, just as we didn't stop a generation ago, those men that went to fight against fascism and Franco in Spain. That was unpopular at the time. Within a couple of years, we recognised that what they were doing was the right thing. The 5% we didn't get, I guess, was the extension of a three-year period when you can withhold a passport. We learned at the committee that we'd, and the Minister repeated in the House, I think there have been nine passports removed from people since 2010. Very small number of people. Not one of those people have applied to get their passport back. And if they did, the Minister, the Minister of Internal Affairs has the power to decline them for another year and a year after that. So what we didn't accept was that there was an argument under this form of urgency to withhold passports for a full three-year period after the first year. And I remain unconvinced of that. Uh, Mr Speaker, we also got uh, the changes uh, to the amendments to the Custom Act that the uh, Privacy Commissioner had recommended, his involvement in the process of ensuring that those powers are not misused, and a restriction of access to data to the same data that the Customs staff themselves had and not beyond that. So when I look down the list of our recommendations, um, we achieved just about everything that we wanted in terms of changing the bill. And it would have been churlish of us, having got the changes that we said were minimally necessary to make it acceptable, then not to accept the bill. This bill comes out of this House, and I think all of my colleagues will agree with this on the committee, in a better state than it came into the House. And that was vital. I want to make a couple of general points, sir. The real protections against terrorism lie not in legislation, though this legislation may help. They lie in having a harmonious and inclusive society. They lie in our moderate Muslim community that are responsible and do the right thing. And they lie in our reputation internationally as a country that acts independently and has a sense of good international citizenship. And during the course of this debate, there have been things that have worried me. On a Q&A program, I listened to Stephen Franks, ex the ACT Party, and ex, well, still the National Party, I think, saying we shouldn't be bringing people in from Pakistan. Now, I know Kanwalji Bakshi would not agree with that. That is a racist comment that casts a slur across a, an entire community because one or two people might be miscreants. I heard the Prime Minister talk about beheadings in the street. I hope he's reconsidered that. It was a foolish and unwise thing to talk about and the sort of fear that that engendered. I heard the New Zealand First Party talking about it's a mistake to bring people in from the Middle East 
when some of us have got many people from the Middle East. Read the Hansard, Mr Mark. You will see it. We all heard it. David Bennett heard it because he followed it up as a speaker. What I am saying is that we should not cast a slur on any individual because of their ethnicity and their religion. If we can create a decent society that does not marginalise and alienate any of our communities, then we will not have the problem of terrorism that face point of other order. countries. Point of order, uh, Ron Mark. I am going to say to you, Mr Speaker, I take offence at the allegations and assertions from Mr no, Goff. No, no. I, well, Member finish, Wissett. please. Member Wissett. Order. The member is... This is a, a debate. Uh, it's, it's a strong rebuttal point. Uh, and those comments um, are, are fairly reflected in this House, uh, and I'm not upholding your point of order. Uh, the Honourable Phil Goff. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I, I, want to, I want to finish on this point. It's one thing to go through this process and come out with a piece of legislation that is in a more acceptable form. What is critically important is to have in the review that's going to take place a strengthening of the independent powers of the Inspector General of Intelligence and Security and I believe a strengthening in more independent oversight of the security intelligence services by our selects committee without the conflict of interest that currently exists there. 